Okay, today we're going to do a reading, a historical reading of the White Man's Burden poem by Rudyard Kipling. And we remember uh, Rudyard Kipling as the author of the poem we looked at, um, We and They. We used that poem as an example of a social Darwinistic writing of uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, Kipling was an English journalist, poet, writer, also wrote The Jungle Book and a poem, poem If, was the first Englishman to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was um, classified as an imperialist slash uh, social Darwinist, similar to Cecil Rhodes. Um, so, and thus his works are assumed not to be satire. It is assumed that he believed in uh, the concepts behind We and They and The White Man's Burden. And he did uh, live in multiple different places, uh, in England, United States, India, and South Africa. Now, the, the definition for the poem, The White Man's Burden, is the title of the poem, but it's also taken to mean, in uh, Kipling's term, for uh, the heavy load and task of, quote, civilizing and, quote, helping the colonies during imperialism. Okay, the term became used um, as synonymous for imperialism or uh, in place of imperialism by both uh, people who supported imperialism and also more importantly people who were anti-imperialist. People who were anti-imperialist um, really took this poem, highlighted its racism, highlighted this poem as whereas Kipling thought it might be everything good about imperialism, the people who didn't want countries to take over countries used it to highlight uh, everything bad about the attitude of the people, the imperialist nations ruling the colony. So it was, uh, it was used heavily by the anti-imperialist as an attack point to attack this poem and say, look what's wrong. Look how people are thinking and look how it's wrong. We have this overview from uh, George Mason University, 1899 British novelist, poet Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem, White Man's Burden in the United States and uh, Philippine Islands. In this poem, Kipling urged the US to take up the burden of empire as had Britain and other European nations. Published 19, uh, 1899, McClure's Magazine, the poem coincided with the beginning of Philippine-American War, U.S. Senate ratification of the treaty that placed Puerto Rico, Guam, Cuba, and Philippines under American control. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt soon became become vice president and then president, copied the poem and sent it to his friend, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, commenting that it was rather poor poetry, but good sense from the expansion point of view. Not everyone was favorably impressed as Roosevelt. The, uh, the radicalized notion that the white man's burden became a euphemism for imperialism, and many anti-imperialists couch their opposition in reaction to the phrase. It's a very interesting uh, time right at the 1900s. So the question is, is the United States going to follow in the footsteps of the European countries? Now, by that time, 1899, the European countries had taken direct control or indirect control over large swaths, all, almost all of Africa, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, spheres in East Asia direct or indirect control, Australia. So the question was, was the United States going to be colonizing uh, islands and countries and nations like the Europeans did? And there was a lot of argument back and forth on this kind of expansion in the United States. Regardless of the American history, we are going to use the poem to look into um, European imperialist thought because Kipling is summarizing European imperialist thought and urging the United States to be like them. From this point on, I'll just um, mention like, be like Great Britain, because uh, Kipling was British. Okay, this is a scan of how the poem would look in the magazine. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stanzas. I guess that's what they're called, stanzas. Um, not being an English major. Let us remember that Kipling is the narrator. So we assume that he is talking, basically. And we assume he is talking to the English or US governments who are going to go and or already running colonies. Examples of some of the colonies would be the Philippines, India, South Africa, Nigeria, Australia, etc., etc. Okay, a uh, little map we used from we and they. So we uh, Kipling is British, so this would be uh, Great Britain. Everything in red here except the U.S. was uh, territories, not all of them, but most of them of the British Empire. And we're going to circle the United States because Kipling wants the United States culture to spread just like the British culture is spread to South Asia, areas in Southeast Asia, Australia, and Africa. And some British colonies still left over in the Americas. Not many, though. And let's give ourselves a note. This poem is advanced. I ran it through readability uh, programs, and the scores put it late high school through college. And those programs, those tests, are basically just using sentence length and syllables. Okay, when you look at this poem, it's got short sentences and uh, not so many syllables, and it's saying it's 
high school to college. But remember, this is a poem from the 1900s. So the word choice and um, the obscurity of the sentences is going to add multiple layers of difficulty on top of just actually reading the sentences with the words. So, you know, if the readability programs are saying that this one's kind of difficult, you've got to add layers of difficulty on because it's a poem. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, seriously complex. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go stanza by stanza. I'll say the definitions that I think we need to know first. I'll read the poem. I'll translate it into uh, simpler words, and then I will give my notes and observations as a source dice teacher. Okay. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught sullen people, half-devil, half-child. Kipling talking to the U.S. or English government about the colonies. Burden is a heavy task or load. Heavy harness is the thing put around an ox before it's ready to do work and plow. Sullen means gloomy and bad-tempered. So what I get from this is a translation, go do your duty, U.S. and England, take up the white man's burden, go do your duty. Send forth your best citizens, send them to the colonies to help the indigenous people of the colonies. Your people will be like working animals trying to help directionless, wild indigenous people. The indigenous people are devilish and childlike. Now, I want to say these translations are my translations, which is a master's degree in education field of social studies. I am not a, a literature uh, master's degree person, so I may be wrong in some of my interpretations, but I get, I am sure I get most of it, of this poem correct. And some notes about that. Um, I noticed that Kipling is once again setting up an us versus them. If you remember in the poem, we versus they, he really did a lot of work to set up the we culture of Great Britain and the they culture of everybody else and did a lot of his time in that poem making the English culture superior and everyone else's culture inferior and over and over and over saying about that. Well, he's setting it up again. So the us is good. Uh, the imperialists, the best ye breed, send, send your sons, the awesome ones, over to help those in need. And then the them would be characterized as bad. He uses the term sullen, half devil, half child, wild. So he's setting up another uh, tribalistic, ethnocentric, social Darwinistic idea, us versus them. He also sets up the task. The main idea of the poem is the task of the white man to help go uh, uh, to serve and to work for the people, quote-unquote, helping. Okay, um, stanza two, abide means to act in, veil is to hide, like with a veil, and to check is to stop. Checks and balances, different parts of the government check and stop the others when the others get too powerful, so to check is to stop. Take up the white man's burden, in patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror, and check the show of pride. By open speech and simple, an hundred times made plain, to seek another's profit, and to work another's gain. Okay, translation. Um, I'm gonna, he says this every time, take up the white man's burden. It means, go do your duty, United States and England. I'm gonna stop saying that, because he says it all the time, go do your duty. Act with patience towards the colonies. Hide the fact that you are so much stronger militarily. Don't show your pride and how you think you're superior to the colonies. When you're helping them and teaching them, use simple words like you're talking to a child by open speech and simple and a hundred times made plain, repeating yourself because they don't uh, repeat the lessons hundreds of times because they until they understand, before they understand, because they don't understand to seek another. You're there to help them to work another's game. You're working for the colony's benefit. Okay, my notes and observations of stanza two. Again, he's contrasting the we and they. The we, the English or the U.S., powerful and prideful, militarily powerful, prideful, uh, superior culture. They being simple, needs explanation, frustrating to the imperialists. So he's uh, making the we and they uh, dichotomy right there. Again, he's reinforcing that imperialism 
is for the benefit of the local people for the colonies. Now he's, and no, he's totally ignoring all the dollars that the imperialist nations are making, all the money, all the resources, all the empire glory that Great Britain and other imperialist nations are making. So we're seeing a one-sided argument here. And this is what a lot of people pick up on when, uh, when they reacted and didn't like the poem. Um, they're saying, look, you're not telling the whole story. Like you're focusing in on like takeover is only to help the colonies and you're totally ignoring that literally uh, like the main idea countries are taking over others is to make wealth. So um, so a lot of people are at the time going to take a lot of uh, umbrage. They're not going to like this poem because they think he's being a propagandist. They think he's being biased and he is. Okay, stanza three. Um, cease means to stop. Sloth is laziness. I think that's why we call them sloths because they move slowly. Heathen means uh, someone of a different religion. Folly means foolishness, and naught means nothing. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace. Fill full the mouths of famine, and bid the sickness cease. And when your goal is nearest, the end for others sought. Watch sloth and heathen folly. Bring all your hopes to naught. Okay, remember, Rudyard Kipling is talking to the governments of Great Britain and the United States. So whenever he tells someone to do something, when it sounds a, a command, what is that called, the imperative? When he tells someone to do something, he's telling the governments to go and serve the colonies. Do this, do this. He's telling the English people to go and do it. That's who he's commanding in this poem. So he's saying, go do your duty. Create peace in the colonies. Stop local wars. Teach the local people new farming so they are not starving. Whether they were starving before or not is immaterial. Kipling says, go teach them how to farm, even if they know how to farm. Teach the local people about Western medicine. Bid the sickness cease. And when you're almost done with all the work helping them, when your goal is nearest, the end, the end for others sought, watch as their laziness and foolishness ruin all the work you did for them. Watch sloth and heathen then folly bring all your hopes to naught. Notes for uh, this stanza. He's, he, he's um, listing, enunciating uh, the, the benefits that imperialism will bring, an end to war, an end to famine, an end to sickness. And he's also saying what will happen, he's predicting what will happen, and by saying that the local people will ruin all the work because they are lazy and foolish. Now is a good time after stanza three to bring up the point. Reading this poem today, in today's context, in today's world, with how the world thinks about different cultures today? Would this poem be considered racist today with how he talks about different people? The answer is yes, definitely. But it is also incredibly worth noting that would it be considered racist in 1900? Also yes, by many people. Now, not by everybody, because this was an idea, social Darwinism in 1900, but there was a good a number of people that believed in equality of cultures and would consider this poem racist and over the top and not welcome. And that's why there was so much pushback and people writing in response against this poem. Okay, stanza four, the definitions are toil, which means work, surf, was a European medieval worker. Ports are cities where the ships are docked, or parts of the city, really. And to tread is to walk. Kipling talking to the government of the US and England. Take up the white man's burden. No iron rule of kings, but toil of surf and sweeper, the tale of common things. The ports ye shall not enter, the roads ye shall not tread. Go, make them with your living, and mark them with your dead. So go do your duty, US and Britain, he says. Not as conquering kings, but send your people as workers for the colony. You, I, don't know, I don't know these next lines. I'm not that good. Here's my best guess of what he means. You won't stay in already made cities and use roads. You'll be the ones making the cities and the roads. Bring urbanization, bring infrastructure. Eh, maybe that's what he means. And it's probably going to be so much work, it'll work some of your people to death. Make them, build them with your living, and mark them with your dead. That's the best I can do for that. That's what I think he means there. And if I am correct, 
my notes and observations about this is it's a stanza about how much work it's going to be to build the colonies. It won't be a rule, a kingly rule where someone goes in and has a luxury life of a king. It'll be the rule of a worker building a colony. Okay, number five, to reap is to gather, to reap is to gather things up, and to humor is a verb, is to act to keep someone content. If I'm doing things to keep someone happy, I am humoring them. Okay. Take up the white man's burden and reap his old reward. The blame of those ye better, the hate of those ye guard. The cry of hosts ye humor, ah, slowly, towards the light. Why brought ye us from bondage, our loved Egyptian knight? Okay, translation. Uh, go do your duty, U.S. and Britain. Same thing every time. Here is the thanks you will be getting for helping the colonies. The locals will blame you even though you're better than them. The locals will hate you even though you're helping them. And even though you are trying to keep them happy, they will yell, why did you change our culture? Question mark? I'm not really sure this part. The cry of, I get the cry of hosty humor. The people you're trying to keep happy will yell at you. But this part, towards the light, why you brought us from bondage, our loved Egyptian night. I, get, I translate that into why did you change our culture? I don't know. I'm not that good. Cut me some slack. This is some tough stuff. Uh, this is some tough stuff when you don't read other interpretations and, you, and Kipling's gone and I can't ask him what it means. So uh, cut me some slack. That's what I think it means. My notes and observations. Um, Kipling uses this stanza to predict how the colonies will react to the help of the imperialist nations. So I'll put the help in quotes. He predicts they will not be grateful. I mean, to editorialize too, if you didn't want your country taken over and someone's come in and they've taken over your country and they're making a lot of money off of you and changing your culture, are you going to be grateful? Do you want them there? A lot of people don't. And because this poem is so biased and it's not giving the other side of the story, this part of the poem is where everyone who is against imperialism, everyone who doesn't agree with imperialism, is just screaming at the page, of course they are not grateful. You just took them over and are making tons of money off their countries. Okay, stanza six. Sullen again means gloomy and moody. Stoop is to lower one's morals, to stoop down to go under the bar of moral goodness. Weariness is tiredness. Take up the white man's burden, ye dare not stoop to less, nor call too loud on freedom to cloak your weariness. By all ye will or whisper, by all ye leave or do, the silent sullen peoples shall weigh your gods and you. Oh, sorry, shall weigh your God and you. Again, in this translation, I have one sentence I'm not sure of, um, so I'm, I just do my best. Go do your duty, U.S. and Britain. You shouldn't ignore this challenge. Don't become tired and try to use freedom, either your own freedom or theirs, as an excuse to stop. I don't know whose freedom he's talking about. Be aware of all your actions and your words, because the locals will be judging you and your God. And you have to be an inspiration, a role model to them, promoting the British or U.S. culture. They will weigh your God and you. You know, this brings in the social Darwinistic idea, right? That the culture is a role model to the rest of the world and everyone wants to be that culture. So, you know, in this, this sentence, weighing, weighing you, judging you, he's saying, be the role model that you know you are because you're promoting the social Darwinism and the culture. Some notes and observations. He mentions it's a moral obligation to change the civilization. So the idea of not stooping to less really brings in a moral obligation. Uh, recognizing it will be hard and there will be weariness. And he says to be an inspiration and a good role model even when tired. This is kind of um, bringing in the ideas of parentalism, acting as a parent a little bit. He's hinting at it in this, in this where even though you're tired, uh, y y you can't quit. And he's hinting at a sort of parental, being a role model, he's hinting at a parental relationship. And we're at the take-home stanza, the last stanza. The de definitions are uh, proffered means offered. Um, feel free to use that word at any time. Just take offered if you offer something and put a PR in front of it, proffered. Uh, it's still actually used today. 
um, in a lot of literature. So feel free to uh, use that one. Laurel is an award, like the old laurel reefs, I think, in Roman Greek times. Ungrudged means willing. Uh, it was a tough one. And peers are those who are like you on your own social level. Okay. Take up the white man's burden. Ooh, exclamation point. That's different, isn't it? Yep. Yep. That's a literary thing. That's not, that's not historical. So I'm pretty impressed that I found a literary thing right there. Tell, tell, uh, tell the English professor friends of mine, I found something literary. That's a first. It's the end. It's the last stanza. So we put an exclamation point on that. Take up the white man's burden. Exclamation point have done with childish days, the lightly proffered laurel, the easy, ungrudged praise. Come now to search your manhood through all the thankless years, cold-edged with dear-bought wisdom, the judgment of your peers. Translation. Go do your duty, U.S. and Britain! Exclamation point. Stop, okay, stop being child, na have done with childish, stop being child nations and be adult nations with responsibility. Lightly offered, probably easy on. When you're a child, awards and praise come easy, right? Everyone awards children stuff. Everyone praises children. Now you're a man, an adult, and you have to earn the awards and the praise. How do you earn it? Earn it with years of thankless work. No thanks from those you help. And a little tough on this part, I'm not really sure. But someone, probably you, is going to obtain wisdom through your years of work, and your efforts will be judged by your fellow countrymen, your peers back home, and other imperialists who do the work will judge you. E, I'm a little shaky on the end of this, but I got the first off of it. Have done with childish days. Now you're an adult. Now you have responsibility. You're going to actually have to work for your re rewards and your praise, because you're not a child anymore, so you've got to earn it with years of thankless work. I'm dead set that that's correct interpretation. And then there's going to be a lot of experience, and there's going to be a lot of praise from peers, and I don't know exactly how that works. Notes and observations. All nations were like children, I think he's getting at. But then the Industrial Revolution happened, and the whole, well, not the whole world, but countries with factories changed. They grew up. And this was the idea of the social Darwinistic people, that those countries with factories adapted to the new world, and they grew up. And now it's time for them to take responsibility for humanity, because they're the adults in the world. Social Darwinistic. And then the adult responsibilities is hard work. Once you do grow up, you have to take on the burden of responsibility. But with it comes judgment of a job well done. Earned praise and earned rewards. So basically he's saying grow up and start changing the world. So here's our wrap up. In my opinion, basically the poem sets up a scenario that it's time for the industrial cultures to take cultural control of the world and spread their culture. Sets up a moral excuse for taking over. And that excuse is helping others, helping other cultures. He's not going to say Great Britain's taken over for the money. He's not going to write a poem about that. You know, people who, uh, who responded to him wrote poems about imperialists taking over for the money. That was the argument against Kipling, that it was all for the money. He makes the argument that it's all for the good of helping others, whether they want it or not. He recognizes that those in the colonies probably won't want it and will not be happy with the takeover. And he reinforces the idea that the industrial cultures are superior and the culture and the colony cultures are considered inferior social Darwinism. Now, because it's a, a skill we teach, I'm going to detect some bias in this poem. Um, well, some of the biggest bias, the one sidedness of it, he leaves out the other causes of imperialism. And I would argue the real cause of imperialism, economic gain and empire glory having the glory of an empire, I think those two are really the reason that imperialism happened. And the idea of helping a civilization is tertiary, third, or just an excuse made up to hide the fact that it's really about the money and the glory. Um, so that means it's biased. He's leaving out other causes. Uh, the unbelievably large amount of negative stereotype words describing whole groups of people, basically everyone who's not British, uh, uh, the just negative stereotypes 
just the whole. That, that's incredibly biased, one side. And it's not by accident, because he gives all the positive stereotypes to the imperializers. So he's one-sided argument there. Uh, hyper hyperbole, exaggeration is all over the place. And he leaves out any arguments of why not to imperialize. He's making this whole poem of why they should imperialize, and he doesn't have any arguments of why imperialization is bad. And there's plenty of people in 1900 who are arguing imperialism is bad. So this is a one-sided poem, only the good about imperialism, and because it's one-sided, biased. So what was the poem's reception at the time? Well, I don't have the percentage of people who liked it, the percentage of people who didn't like it, um, but I know there were all sides. Fans of imperialism did like it, okay? They used it as a, a moral reason to go imperializing. It's much better to say you're doing it to help somebody than you're doing it to make money off of somebody. So the fans of imperialism liked it. But remember, there was plenty, plenty of anti-imperialists that didn't like it. I mean, um, a very, a very quick look can find four to five rebuttal essays, rebuttal poems or rebuttal essays directly responding to Kipling in the negative, saying he's wrong. And they were by prominent figures. I mean, famous people at the time, published in famous papers and magazines. So it was a very public rebuttal of Kipling, and there was public support. If GMU is to be believed, George Mason University, Teddy Roosevelt kind of liked his ideas of imperialism. Can we judge this poem by today's standards? I guess that should be in reception today, right? Uh, yes and no. We can judge it a little. Um, so sometimes you look back at a poem and say, well, that's just what everybody thought at the time. So it's tough to judge the person because everyone was thinking it. That is not the case. There was a moral debate in 1899. There were people who said imperialism is wrong. There are people that called for the equality of cultures and the equality of different um, people from different nations. Okay? There is, there is um, religious theory at the time that everyone was the child of God. There was enlightenment ideas uh, that people are born equal. There are people voicing the opinion of equality and not these racist stereotypes. So we can judge Kipling a little because he had a real choice. People in 1899 had a real choice. There was the choice to be anti-imperialist and the choice to be imperialist. So people made conscious choices to take over other uh, countries. There was the option, there was the thought, there were people working to say no to imperialism and to promote equality. So what are the numbers and the percentages of imperialists versus anti-imperialists? I don't know, but I do know Kipling uh, and Cecil Rhodes and Kipling and all the other pro-imperialists were educated enough to know the arguments against imperialism and they chose to still support it. So we can judge a little bit and we can say that even for the time, even for the time, this poem was a little over the top, a little bit really pushing the edge, even for its time. So we can judge that. What would this poem have as a reception today? It is very, very simple. This would be seen as a wholly racist poem. It would not be uh, published in serious, serious um, journals. It would not be given awards. It would not be accepted by the literature community. It would not be accepted by uh, political scientists as even an idea that we would be looking at. It would not be accepted by social scientists. The world has changed 100% in the other direction from this poem in 120 years. Further, the main idea, so not only would the, the words and the implications of different cultures be totally rejected, the main ideas of cultural superiority and forced help and civilizing missions and taking over other countries are ideas rejected by the world nations today. The world nations come together in something called the United Nations, and the United Nations and the nations that make up that group have rejected taking over other countries, 
the idea of cultural superiority and the idea of forced help and forced change of culture. Those three ideas found in this poem are 100% rejected by the countries of the world today. And so that leaves Rudyard Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden, as a historical source, non-relevant to the world today, used only as an insight as to the thinking of some imperialists at the turn of the 20th century. All right, thanks for watching.